Well, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Karen Commander, coming to you from just south of Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a registered nurse and chair of the National Council to Improve Patient Safety Through Health Literacy, which is co-hosting this event today. I'm also founder and president of Health Literacy 360 LLC and co-founder and past president of Ohio Health Literacy Partners. Now, during the event today, I would like to ask you to please share on social media, join in the conversation using the hashtags that you see up there on your screen. We'd also like to welcome to our event today, um, staff members from the US Senate and congressional staff. We have representatives for Congressman Tom Emmer from Minnesota, Brad Finstad from Minnesota, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur from Ohio, Congresswoman Elon Omar from Minnesota, and Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. Now, co-hosting this event today is Memory Keepers, and I'd like to, at this time, introduce Dr. Kristen Jacqueline to make a couple of opening remarks. Dr. Jacqueline? Good morning. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the U.S. Health Literacy Policy and Press event on behalf of the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team at the University of Minnesota, and we're based on the Duluth campus of the medical school. Our mission at Memory Keepers is to engage Indigenous and rural communities in culturally meaningful research to improve dementia and brain health outcomes for all. We do this by working in partnership with communities and community-based organizations and placing value on local knowledge in our research. The rural and Indigenous communities we work with typically have higher rates of chronic disease, including Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, compared to the general population. And the reasons for these disparities are related to the social determinants of health, which low levels of health literacy contribute to significantly. In these populations, health literacy is impacted by a lack of access to understandable health information, a lack of information tailored to their contexts, being in rural and Indigenous communities, and a lack of culturally appropriate health resources. As an institute driven to reduce health disparities and promote health equity, the University of Minnesota Medical School and Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team supports health literacy. We approach health literacy as an asset and work with communities to find appropriate ways to communicate health information. All of us at the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team incorporate health literacy into our work by providing communities with research results that are accessible, understandable, and actionable. Our community-based research on dementia and healthy aging has produced several Indigenous-specific resources aimed at enhancing knowledge of the illness, prevention strategies, and healthcare planning. As one of our team's experts in health literacy, Dr. Janelle Lamont has provided health literacy training to state and local health departments, dental safety net providers, and aging professionals, and is leading state and national health literacy initiatives. We are grateful to be co-hosting this event with the National Council to improve patient safety through health literacy and look forward to this much needed discussion. I would like to thank the organizers and the participants for their efforts to make this a successful event and wish you all the best with the remainder of the program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. Um, I'd like to now just cover a few housekeeping guidelines um, as we go through the event today. Um, please remain muted throughout the event. Now, if you do have any questions, we ask that you put them in the Q&A feature. Um, but because of our very tight timeline, all of your questions will be compiled and responses sent to you about one to two weeks following the event. Now the chat option is available for you to greet and interact with each other, but we do ask that you keep that um, to a minimum. And also please note that again, because of our tight timeline, 
The introduction of our speakers will be brief. However, a link to our event website is located in the chat where you can directly reach the um, bios for all of the speakers. So again, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the National Council to Improve Patient Safety Through Health Literacy. Our team is comprised of 18 health professionals from the, across the United States, and we've been working together for the last several years to raise health literacy awareness and advocate for policy change. Now, again, I'm really honored to be with you here today to address the critical and pressing issue that affects each and every one of us, health literacy. Now, this national event is a pivotal moment for us to collectively recognize the paramount importance of health literacy in our society and to deliberate on the imperative need for comprehensive policies to advance this cause. Now, through the course of this event, we'll hear from experts in the field who will share best practices and innovative ideas. And together, we'll explore how we can collaboratively shape the future of health literacy policy in our nation, ensuring that it is inclusive, accessible, and responsive to the needs of our population. So now I'm delighted to be able to introduce Ms. Cindy Brock. Cindy is the Senior Health Literacy Care Research at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and co-chair of Health Literacy Workgroups, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We're thrilled to have you as our keynote today and welcome, Cindy. Well, thank you so much, Karen. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Um, and to be able to talk to you briefly about the history of health literacy in HHS and some ideas about opportunities going forward. Um, HHS has been at, in the field from the beginning and our first um, big landmark was in the year 2000 where um, health literacy was included as an objective for the first time in Healthy People. Healthy People is our national health promotion program. And um, with improving health literacy as a new objective that stimulated a lot of work at the department. Um, we formed an HHS health literacy work group, which continues to this day, put out evidence uh, reports, um, did a national assessment of individual health literacy, personal health literacy that was reported out at um, a Surgeon General's workshop in 2006. And then in 2010, we had the National um, Action Plan to Improve Health Literacy. And that plan was really a public-private partnership. It, um, it demonstrated how everyone from employers to insurers, from clinicians to librarians had a role in health literacy improvement. So since then, um, the various parts of the department have been working um, uh, to develop implementation tools and training. Uh, the idea is that in order to pursue health literacy, we need to create awareness, we need to train people, and we need to give them the tools that they need to do the work. Um, so I'm just going to you know, mention a couple of examples. Um, my colleagues at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, they have uh, public health professional training available for free um, continuing education credits other trainings, um, implementation tools, planning tools. In my agency, ARC, as we call ourselves, um, as you can see, have um, a huge number of tools recognizing that um, addressing health literacy is part of our mission to um, make healthcare safer and more person-centered. I want to, though, tell you a, a story that illustrates that just um, creating tools is not enough, that we really need to, to up our game here. And um, it starts with ARC having created some training modules called Making Informed Consent and Informed Choice. And these modules combined health literacy strategies with shared decision-making strategies. And the Joint Commission 
had made them freely available for continuing med medical education credit um, on their learning management system. So for years, we had a steady stream of people taking the training, both the, the leadership training and, and largely the, the health professional training. Um, but about a year ago, we've seen a shift. And that shift has been that now medical facilities are contacting us for the training to put on their own learning management systems so they can train their entire staff, that they want to do this at a systems level. Now, how, how come we've seen that change? It's because the LeapFrog group, which is a group that harnesses the power of healthcare purchasers in order to improve quality, they put out a voluntary standard around informed consent. Um, voluntary now, possibly not voluntary later. So lots of facilities that um, want to meet LeapFrog standards said, okay, we, we need to get on this and we need to train our staff. Yeah. And so we saw that, um, that we've been able to leverage the standard um, to a whole new um, engagement at the systems level. And that's what we really need. You know, it's, it's great having passionate um, clinicians, but even the um, most skilled, well-intentioned clinician can't single-handedly overcome health literacy barriers. And, and so we really need to lean in on um, the systems level. Now, we've made progress in recent years. I've, I've seen more healthcare organizations um, understanding that if patients don't understand health information, it's our responsibility to make it easier to understand and act on. If they're not getting to the services they need, it's our responsibility to create a system that you can navigate and access those services. Um, we've also seen more understanding that we need a universal approach, that anybody can face health literacy challenges. Uh, you know, when, when you're sick or tired, you know, your ability to to um, take in information can go down. And so we always need to be health literate with every single person. But unfortunately, we've also seen some backsliding. Um, you know, some leading organizations that used to be very vocal champions um, for health literacy have kind of receded into the background. And we really want them to re-engage and, and join in again. Um, uh, so what are our opportunities for doing this going forward? Well, um, it, it is to really lean in on this idea of a health literate organization. Um, over a decade ago, I led some colleagues at the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academies of Medicine, in articulating what is a health literate organization? What do you do in order to be health literate? And um, having, having that roadmap with lots of other tools on, on how to do this work, um, we really hope are, we're going to engage at the systems level. Um, we also have an opportunity with Healthy People. So Healthy People 2030 has elevated health literacy. Um, health literacy is now part of the overarching goals and foundational principles. And what that means is that we are saying health literacy is a prerequisite to achieving all of our other health, healthy people objectives, that we need to make sure information is easy to understand, find, use, um, and and we also in Healthy People 2030 came out with a new, new definitions for health literacy that articulated something that we all in the field knew all along, which is health literacy is not just an individual's attribute. It's not just my personal ability to do something, but there is organizational health literacy, which as you'll see on this slide, is the degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. And, and these two definitions together is what constitutes health literacy. Now, you'll see that I highlighted um, equitable. 
um, on this. And that's because health literacy and health equity are intrinsically connected. You know, using language your audience does not understand is an act of exclusion. And health literacy is a very strong driver right now. Um, it's what I call a, a train leaving the station. And we need to make sure that everyone recognizes that part of health, that, that health literacy strategies can actually help advance health equity, that, that using plain language and confirming understanding testing materials with intended audiences, using interpreters and translated materials, materials, and designing websites that are accessible and tech inter interventions that are easy to use for everybody, that this is an essential part of the way that we are going to get to health equity. So uh, I'll close with a, a quote from Cliff Coleman, um, a colleague who recently published a, a perspective in JAMA, and he said, lack of organizational literacy and clear communication policies are preventable structural features of the U.S. healthcare system and contribute to systematic racism. So I invite all of you in recognizing that um, our, our way to reducing disparities in this country in healthcare and in um, health is paved with health literacy strategies. Thank you. Back well, to you, Karen. Yes, thank you so much, Cindy. And so as we've just heard through national research and practice, we do have evidence-based strategies and tools that work. So I'm going to come down here and talk about implementing these strategies as policy is crucial as the consequences of failing to do so have far reaching individual community and national implications. So why does this all matter? So I'm gonna go through a couple of very briefly, some implications on all of these levels. So first I'd like to introduce you to Lynn, Bernie and Kevin. Lynn, a registered nurse and single mom of four. Bernie, a pilot, race car driver, meteorologist for our very own Cleveland Indians, now Cleveland Guardians. And Kevin, the jokester, a human resources and health communication specialist. These are three of my four siblings that were diagnosed with a chronic debilitating disease when they reached their mid to late thirties. Now what followed was over two decades of struggling alongside each one of them through numerous hospitals, visits, specialty, office visits, untold number of surgeries, and I have to tell you that frequently I felt overwhelmed, frustrated, simply exhausted with all of the medical jargon, miscommunication, and overall struggle through this maze. Despite my clinical experience as a nurse and educator, I again struggled through all of this. So today I'm here to live on our family's motto, which was, we do hard. Next, I'd like you to meet Nancy. Nancy is a wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, former French boutique business owner, and also my mother-in-law. Now, at the age of 75, Nancy underwent open-heart surgery, and she did well with the exception of developing the irregular heart rhythm atrial fibrillation, for which she was placed on a blood thinner Coumadin. Now at her six month office visit, her doctor said to her, Nancy, you're doing well, but I'm gonna start you on a little aspirin. And went on to explain how aspirin has similar blood thinning qualities as Coumadin. So Nancy went home and started her aspirin and stopped her Coum Coumadin. Now, unfortunately, that was not the doctor's intent. Within a week, Nancy ended up in the intensive care unit on a ventilator with multiple blood clots in her lungs. Now, thankfully she survived this, but I'd like you to consider if this outcome might have been different if an evidence-based tool called TeachBack to confirm understanding 
was done in her provider's office. Now, implications beyond the individual include all of our health professionals. Now, many health professionals believe that they communicate clearly, but have not been trained on practices such as always using plain language and always using teach back to confirm understanding. Next is healthcare organizations. Now, as Cindy Brock noted, we do have tools that we can use, for example, the 10 attributes of a health literate healthcare organization. And they can be used to address in hospitals, complex jargon, medical terminology, the long and complex forms, inadequate health education materials, limited language access, and lack of training of the entire workforce. Now, public health departments must also consider health literacy when designing and implementing programs and communication strategies. And interventions and policies are needed to address, again, jargon and technical language, looking at health literacy when communicating things like risk, complex forms and documentation, inconsistent messaging, and also lack of training in the public health workforce. Now, transitioning to a wider perspective, it's essential that we recognize the importance of addressing and pursuing policies concerning the rampant spread of misinformation and disinformation, a problem that became particularly evident during, during our pandemic and what the World Health Organization has described as an infodemic. Now, this information or misinformation is widely spread on social platforms. Of note, one study found that prevalence of health misinformation is highest on Twitter and on issues related to smoking products and drugs, as well as major public health issues, such as vaccines and diseases. Now, this is all broad community impact as people pass on incorrect info, very similar to the game of telephone. Now, finally, we must address the need for national research and policy around the use of artificial intelligence. Now, not only for its use in the field of medicine, but also for its impact on the general public. A point of particular interest was a New York Times article earlier this year, which released findings of two reports that identified hundreds of social media posts and news websites that are using AI to create inauthentic content online. Now, many of these sites included health information portals that published numerous AI-generated articles offering medical advice. Bottom line, policy guidance to focus on clear, accessible, factually accurate health information is a public health imperative. And I think we can all agree our healthcare system is extremely complex and challenging. However, our patients journey through it need not and should not be. Now for our next speaker, someone who has been working on raising awareness on this very issue for quite some time is Ms. Helen Osborne. Helen Osborne is the founder and president of Health Literacy Consultant host of the podcast series, Health Literacy Out Loud, and is founder of Health Literacy Month. Welcome, Helen. Thank you, thank you. Happy Health Literacy Month, everybody. <laughs> okay, I, is it on? Yes. Good, good. Happy Health Literacy Month. People ask me how this month began, and I want to give you the inside story of this one. Health Literacy Month is a time for advocates everywhere to focus on the importance of communicating health information in ways that patients and the public can understand. It's been celebrated worldwide each October. Um, so it has been going strong since I founded it in 1999. Here's the behind the scenes story. 
I first learned of health literacy uh, from a 1995 research article by Dr. Mark V. Williams et al. that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Their research found that many adults in the United States struggle to understand written health information. That was certainly evident on the psychiatric unit in the hospital where I was working in Boston. As a clinician, as a person who cared, I knew right away that health literacy mattered. And I also knew right away I wanted to do something about it. I shortly thereafter left my clinical practice to focus solely on health literacy, but it became clear that many of my clinical colleagues had no idea what health literacy was nor why it mattered. And around the same time, I learned about the reference book called Chase's Calendar of Events that has an extensive listing of national events. I had the notion to create something along the lines of Health Literacy Month, but I didn't want to do so all on my own. So I proposed the idea on a discussion list that we had, a health literacy discussion list, and I received immediate overwhelming support. The gist of most feedback to me was, great idea, what are you going to do? And so began Health Literacy Month. The very first thing I did for Health Literacy Month was to go to my local library, go to read Chase's calendar of events, and for 15 cents, I made a copy of the application form at the back of the book. That's how Health Literacy really got started, on 15 cents. Well, I then worked with a small committee of those people who were championing saying, great idea. And we had a lot of important decisions to make as we got started. And the first one is, when is Health Literacy Month? Well, it's true, we miscommunicate all year long. I chose October because it tends to have better weather and fewer national holidays and religious events. It's also soon before US elections, and I figured politicians would like to be aligned with communicating clearly about health. Also, October had many other health-related events, such as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Physical Therapy Month, and Medical Librarians Month. Also had one of the decisions was, who is this event for? My initial vision, was that to raise awareness among for health literacy among health professionals, all my colleagues around the world who didn't really know quite what health literacy was. And from there, I envisioned ever expanding circles that would later include community organizations and policymakers and the lay public. Health Literacy Month also knows no geographic bounds, so it needs to be worldwide. And the other big decision is what would happen in Health Literacy Month? <clears throat> Given that, it started with just this small committee and my initial investment of 15 cents, I decided it would best to be a grassroots event. Individuals and organizations everywhere can raise awareness and take action in whatever ways matter to their audience and their community. There is no right nor wrong way to participate in Health Literacy Month. Well, Health Literacy Month has become more popular than I ever dared to imagine. There have been hundreds, probably thousands of events taking place across the US and around the world. <clears throat> These include community events to raise awareness about why health literacy matters educational programs that teach skills about ways to improve health communication, and celebrations that highlight how individuals and organizations and communities are taking action. That initial structure and those decisions for Health Literacy Month remain as relevant today as when it first started. In fact, Health literacy has become so popular that it was more than what I, perhaps with a small committee, could do alone. And I am so appreciative that the Institute for Healthcare Advancement is now taking the lead to help everyone, everywhere, raise awareness and encouraging action. Today's webinar 
is like my dream come true. A policy and media event to raise awareness and encourage action. We really are making a difference. Happy Health Literacy Month. Thank you so much, Helen. That was wonderful. Um, so much work through the years and the field is very appreciative for you for starting Health Literacy Month and helping us all move forward. Next up is Dr. Katina O'Leary. Dr. O'Leary is president and CEO of Health Literacy Media, a St. Louis-based nonprofit that develops and distributes health literate and accessible health and science communication. Welcome, Katina. Thank you very much. Um, I wanna talk for just a few moments about health literacy proclamations that have occurred this year and, and in the past years. Um, a proclamation is an official ceremonial document and declaration on behalf of a state, county, or city to commemorate a specific time period, a historic milestone, or significant state or local event. It's important that we remember that a proclamation doesn't indicate or imply any policy endorsement, but it does have the power to raise awareness on a larger scale. And it can be used as a strategy to engage policymakers and leadership in discussions on policies and practices. Um, so we want to share that today, the following states have signed proclamations declaring October is Health Literacy Month. Um, Alabama has done so in 2019 and again in 2023. Georgia has done so in 2015. Maryland in 2011. Minnesota in 2022 and 2023. Ohio in 2022 and 2023. And South Carolina in 2021. Texas in 2019 and 2022. And Wisconsin in 2021 and 2023. This year, health literacy advocates have secured proclamations in Alabama, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, as we just mentioned. In 2022, a subgroup of the Regional Health Literacy Network, led by Dr. Janelle Lamont, developed the State Health Literacy Proclamation Toolkit. This toolkit's free, and it's located on the event website under Take Action tab. It includes information on all these content areas, health literacy and October Health Literacy Month, how to submit a proclamation with links to each state's proclamation request form and instructions for submitting that request, a proclamation template with references, instructions on how to plan and promote a state health literacy proclamation event, an example proclamation event evaluation survey, and key health literacy messages to use in discussions with leadership and policymakers. We know that the more state health literacy month proclamations we can populate to this map, the greater the national awareness will grow. So we're asking people to please check out the toolkit and consider submitting a request to your state um, for the next year and every year after. If you aren't from an organization that's eligible to request a state proclamation, connect with your state's literacy or reading council or public health association, library association, or a nonprofit organization focused on disease prevention and health and wellness. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. O'Leary. And I do want to point out um, a couple of other states do have proclamations. I want to give a shout out to New York and also Pennsylvania and Massachusetts um, have been added to the list. Um, I also just want to take a quick moment here to remind everyone that if you have a question um, at all, please use the Q&A function. That's where we're going to be able to um, load all of the questions and responses after the event. Okay, awesome. So next up is our panel discussion led by Mr. Stan Hudson. Stan Hudson is the Health Literacy Director for Wisconsin Literacy, Inc. Joining the panel is Greg O'Neill. He is the Director of Patient and Family Health Education and Nursing Professional Development at Christiana Care in Delaware. We also have Dr. Marianne Abrams, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and a primary care pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. 
Ms. Wilma Alvarado Little is the Associate Commissioner and Director of the New York State Department of Health Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities Prevention. And finally, Daniela Gritali is the Associate Vice President, Federal Affairs at Nemours Children's Health. Okay, I'm gonna let you take this one away, Stan, thank you. All right, thank you, Karen. I'm really excited today to moderate such an esteemed group of panelists who I, I feel really embody the very diverse perspectives highlighting the importance of, of health literacy. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna take a lot of time. I wanna just jump into the, the questions so you can really hear from the, the panelists. And let's let's start out with you, Greg. Um, you know, you, you really speak from the, the health system perspective. And, and so I'd really like to hear kind of your perspective, you know, lending patient education at that health system level. What, what do you really see? Yeah, thanks, Stan. I appreciate uh, being invited here today. Um, I think it's really important to recognize, as we are doing right now, that for 20 plus years, much has been done to assess the health literacy landscape and promote so, uh, solutions to this crisis. Um, many thought leaders, researchers, academic scholars, and health system advocates have come together over the years and demonstrated the seriousness of the problem. Uh, many have contributed to efforts that we've already mentioned today by the National Academies of Medicine, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and others to craft meaningful interventions, including those outlined in the National Action Plan for Health Literacy. Um, it is important uh, to recognize as well that the focus on quality and safety in healthcare has produced highly reliable care. And this has been accomplished through decades of investment in comprehensive regulation, monitoring, innovation, and incentive structures uh, requiring funding and a dedicated infrastructure. Uh, this has been a worthwhile and a valuable mission to improve care. Uh, for example, uh, you know, I, I think this, this is starting to take shape in the way that health systems communicate with patients and families. Um, and at Christiana Care, uh, where I am uh, based, one of our core behaviors is anticipating the needs of others. Uh, and we're doing that in a few ways, uh, by investing in strategies that bring consistent health information to patients throughout the continuum of care, by supporting a dedicated team of caregivers to work on this issue, and by advocating in our state for a more unified approach to health literacy intervention. Well, thank you, Greg. That's a, that's a lot of hard work. We really appreciate that. Um, what, what else do you think needs to be done though? Well, when I think about the future, uh, what remains to be fully realized in healthcare is this paradigm shift. Um, healthcare systems strive for zero harm in quality and safety. Uh, if we adopted this approach related to how patients and communities understand their health, we would make great strides. We need to establish that health literacy interventions will be a value add uh, to achieving health equity and organizational goals, as we've discussed here already today. There's a great deal of variation in how this is currently done in health systems throughout the country. Uh, it's very important that every model of care being developed consider the health literacy implications. Uh, this can align technology solutions for care delivery with be best practices that can impact the people in our care. So I think um, any type of system that uh, promotes health is part of a larger network of complex and dynamic institutions. Health systems are one part of that network, um, but other partners such as the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Education, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, state health agencies, even corporate and community partners, to name a few, uh, we can all have a big impact on enhancing health literacy. Um, certainly, we can all prioritize learning and understanding health information, but only if the strategies, policies, incentives, and expectations are built in support of that mission. Um, to me, this is one of the many ways we can help our neighbors and communities thrive. All 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Now I'm gonna move on to, to Marianne Abrams. Uh, Dr. Abrams is one of a leading researcher in the field of health literacy. And, and so she has a very unique perspective. And, and I wanted to go back, uh, Marianne, on that. And, and you know, I know Cindy earlier explained kind of that dual definition of individual versus organizational health literacy. Why do you think organizational health literacy is so important? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Stan, and I really want to build on and take what Cindy Brock said and what Greg O'Neill just said, and um, you asked me to sort of speak from the provider perspective. I also train medical students. I'm involved in graduate medical education, and I am helping with organizational health literacy in a variety of ways, so I want to just push down a little closer, but still keep it at that system level. And that system level is this definition of formal definition, finally, of organizational health literacy is so important. And I will even say exciting because it really calls attention to the importance and responsibility of the system to address health literacy. I, I can say as a pediatrician, I observe a variety of situations where misunderstanding health information really impacts patients, family, and the health system. Just a couple examples. A frightened, worried grand uh, caretaker brought her young child to an appointment. They were both terrified because they'd gotten a phone call about growth on a urine specimen. And what they'd been actually told was that there was some bacterial growth on a urine specimen that could have been an infection. The only word they heard was growth, and they thought cancer. And it took 12, 15 minutes to help them understand that that was not a problem. That's just not, not good quality care and such an opportunity for improvement. Another example is parents who bring, they think they're doing the right thing. They're bringing their children back. They have a, they've been diagnosed with a mild viral illness and told, make sure you bring him back to be rechecked if he's not better. They appropriately bring their child back because in their minds, better means totally resolved. In our minds, we're saying if they're not improving, so parents take off work, children miss more school. Appointments get taken up um, and they really didn't need to come back. And I'm sure you've all heard and seen children who end up in the emer urgent care, emergency room, and even get admitted because they don't understand how to use their asthma medicines, their inhalers, the rescue inhaler and the control medication. All those things could be, uh, could be avoidable with clear communication. So to circle back from these examples and others, you can really see that health literacy is fundamental to achieving health equity, safe, high quality care and patient and family centered care. And this is in our wheelhouse and it is our responsibility. And there are, we said earlier, there are things we can do to become health literate organizations, evidence-based practices that we can put in place so they're used routinely and uniformly Greg used the words reliably and sustainably over time, just like we do with errors and medication safety across and throughout the health system. And now we can bring that approach to health literacy. Well, thank you for, for sharing that provider perspective and really, really talking about that. Um, but I, I wanna ask, um, does this apply just to hospitals and doctors offices? You know, a lot of time people think of the traditional, you know, clinic setting, doctor's office, hospital, the educators, the nurses, the doctors, but no, not at all. It's the entire healthcare system's responsibility, and we are talking every member of the healthcare team, whether it's the registration staff, environmental services who may hear a family talking about not understanding something and can go find someone who can answer their questions physical, occupational therapists, dentists, social workers, those are just a few examples. That also, as we've mentioned briefly, our public health and our community-based organizational partners who also provide services and education to promote health and prevent disease. And we have to focus on training our health profession students about the prevalence of the problems associated with limited liter health literacy and how to effectively use health literacy skills like plain language and teach back. And we have to reinforce and support that as they move through their professional roles so that they see faculty role modeling it, evaluating and evaluating it and expecting to see them use those skills. Thank you. And I, 
I want to ask one last question, just because you've, you've been speaking really about organizational health literacy that various health organizations can take. Can you give me some or give us some specific examples of like action steps that, that folks can take to really address this? I will. And it's these are related to, at the organizational level, but to show how organizational actions can help providers and all the members of the team use these skills to ensure quality care. And the 10 attributes of a health literate healthcare organization are a great framework, a great place to start. And organizations should take a look at those and see what aligns with their mission and values and build on those. That includes training all, not just some members of the healthcare team on using that universal precautions approach to communicate clearly, and for everybody to think about their role in communicating clearly to avoid those examples like I talked about before and a couple others. We've had patients with, um, we've seen patients who've had post-operative complications because interpreters were not consistently used. Um, and inadvertent medication overdoses because uh, the medication label was misunderstood. Teach back could be such a tool to help prevent something like that that leads to potential harm or uh, extra health care cost and distress. And then we need to apply improvement science, QI uh, practices, behavior change, behavior change principles to test and refine these uh, skills in our care settings and then hardwire them once we nail that and use policies and procedures to do that, to create the platform for health literacy skill expectations, that this is how we do business. Um, and also to make sure that that includes not just plain language, not just teach back, but interpreter use and other health literacy skills. We need to take advantage of our friend, the electronic medical record uh, to use prompts and reminders and to document use of teach back, to make it easy to remember and do the right thing to use HR processes to include clear communication skills and job descriptions, performance reviews, skills fairs, competency assessments, to look at safety events from a health literacy lens and develop prevention strategies when we see and identify health literacy related events, look at our patient satisfaction and experience data to find areas to improve related to communication, compile those measures into data dashboards and then use those to align with mission um, and values and then track progress over time. Weave this into our health equity work where we, because we know that for a variety of reasons, some groups are at higher risk for not understanding and tools like plain language teach back, a welcoming shame-free environment, trained interpreters can help address that. And if we don't do that, that is a sign of disrespect. And finally, we are working with our partners, um, the local health department, Franklin County Public Health and Columbus Public Health on one of the Department of Health and Human Service grants to build a health literate community. And we are, as part of that work, we're leading health literacy learning collaboratives to pull diverse groups together. Um, and so in addition to clinical teams and hospital and clinic teams, we have the health departments, we have WIC, we have uh, the Office of Justice that works with substance abuse of um, people who've been incarcerated and organ donation, just for some examples. And all of those are focusing on universal precautions, plain language, teach back, class standards to bring that, that health equity, safety, and quality lens to the work. Thank you, Dr. Abrams. I really, really appreciate that. And I especially um, being in health policy for over 30 years, I especially loved your stress on actually measuring this because I, I know in health policy, if you don't measure, it doesn't matter. And so I, I think that's, that's one thing we've been focused on is really trying to get more health systems to start to measure, establish those baselines, and then see where those opportunities for improvement are. All right, now I'm going to move to Wilma Alvarado Little, um, who has a little bit different perspective coming out of public health. And so I know, uh, Wilma, the, the New York State Department of Health has been doing a really good job of infusing and integrating health literacy and plain language into all, all your efforts that you do. Would you uh, share with us kind of your what and why it's so important to do that in public health? 
Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm I'm new to this. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no, thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. Uh for the question, I, I, you know, my my it, my reaction and not my response is how can you not, you know, how can you not, right? Especially in the world of public health, when coming off of the pandemic, our communities maybe did not have the time or the emotional capacity at the moment to decipher pursuant to pursuant to pursuant to, right? When you're looking at at, at state guidance, so we really had to make sure that 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 we provided information in a way that resonated with our communities. And so what we have gone ahead and done with, through the New York State Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities Prevention, you know, our health literary, literacy efforts are recognized as an important aspect of the provision of healthcare services. And so this office champions effective communication in word and in deed in order to support healthy outcomes and well being for all New Yorkers. And so, you know, they're ongoing. Uh, our initiatives and activities speak to the importance of the role in health literacy. You know, the information has to be presented in a manner that's relevant, understandable, and resonates with the diverse communities throughout the state of New York. Our office addresses health literacy and many aspects of programs and initiatives. It is incorporated through the contracts that we um, administer with our community partners. I won't call them contractors or vendors, you know, because they are our partners. And so uh, health literacy, cultural competence, and language access is infused through the work plans and the and the uh, deliverables and performance measures. And so it applies to data, the public and work environments. And so we, you know, we're seen to be a front runner in providing information about health and healthcare and to achieve health equity when information is understood and explained in a manner that resonates with the individual. Because if it doesn't resonate with the individual, then you know what? we have a little bit more work to do. And so we need to be able to do this to provide an environment of trust and collaboration. Thank you. What, uh, why don't you share, will you be able to share some of the health literacy initiatives that you've accomplished there in New York? Oh my goodness, yes. All right, so to name a few, um, the, we were the first State Department of Health to conduct an organization-wide climate survey. And you know, kudos to, uh, Cynthia Bauer and Cindy Brock, who were very supportive in the development of this climate survey. And this was a tool to provide a picture of an organization's needs. It's one thing to say, okay, you know, we need to do health literacy work and infuse it across the entire Department of Health. However, we need to know what we don't know. So one of the major takeaways from the respondents from the survey is that they agreed that health literacy needs to be included and continue to be included in its, in its mission. And also there's an awareness that leadership supports health literacy inclusion because what is valued is, is operationalized and it's also measured. And so staff also responded with requesting additional resources to further support the infusion of health literacy within their programs. And so we were able to identify champions and early adopters and then therefore formalize the process even more. In 2019, the New York State Department of Health also received a proclamation from the governor declaring October as Health Literacy Month. So we were very pleased and, and, uh, and appreciative of that. We have also hosted in-person statewide health literacy summits, which means we invite anyone and everyone across the entire state of New York um, to come and participate and learn about more information and receive more information regarding health literacy initiatives. So speakers invited have included the commissioner of the New York, New York State Department of Health, the president of the State University of New York, SUNY Albany, supporters of health literacy to infuse this and begin to include this at very, very, um, early levels before our students actually go into the into the workforce. And we also had national experts to address an audience which included advocates, researchers, academics, community-based organizations, and you know, other individuals and groups supporting health literacy efforts. We were awarded, the New York State Department of Health was awarded the Center for Disease Control and Prevention National Initiative to address COVID-19 health disparities among populations at risk and underserved. 
So what we have done, we have made sure to infuse uh, the class standards, cultural competence, health literacy, and also language access within our programming. And so this year, as part of Health Literacy Month, we are going to highlight the work of the organizations that are funded through the 2103 CDC grant and to have that opportunity to tout their work because they've been working really long and really hard. I'm very, very appreciative of that. And so our um, efforts are ongoing and there's more to follow. All right. And yeah, I, I, uh, congratulations on that grant. That's important work. You know, I was I was actually looking at your mission and vision earlier and saw that there's a very strong, you know, health equity piece to that. Um, could you explain a little bit more how you feel health literacy supports health equity? Oh, goodness. So you know, the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities Prevention here in the state of New York um, is a legislatively mandated office. And so we are in communication with our federal HHS Office of Minority Health as well. And so having support regarding health equity and also making sure that this is the work that we are doing as part of our charge, legislative and otherwise. And so when we are looking at health literacy and plain language, you know, um, miscommunication does not have any boundaries. And we need to be able to ensure that we continue to be dedicated to improving the health of all New Yorkers. So when people think of the state of New York, sometimes they think of the five boroughs or whatever you see on Law and Order or what's on television. And it's so much bigger than that. And, you know, there's a lot of areas of our rural community, of our urban communities and so how do we meet the needs uh, when it's come when it comes to that effective communication and so we're very fortunate that there are champions for health literacy across the department uh, which we are supportive of each other and always think about having that community at the forefront so what messaging is going to resonate with various communities, right? It, we're looking at racial and health equity and the work that we're doing. We think about it from a linguistic perspective as well. We're looking at what is going to be the, the platform that is going to resonate with our communities. Is it, media, so, is it via social media? Is it in print? Is it a video? What are we doing so that it's not, uh, we don't fall into you know, a one size fits all type of thing. So we also ensure that we're also addressing social determinants of health affecting our communities in spoken and signed communication. So when somebody says to me, oh, we need to make sure that we address diversity. My question to them is what is your definition of diversity? Um, is it, for example, uh, the rural community? Is it, for example, the urban community? Because each of these will have its own language as well. Are we talking adolescents who have their own language? Are we talking our, our aging community? So we need to be aware that the, the language that we use and the communication that is being utilized is going to resonate with those whom we serve and with whom we partner. And and thank you, Wilma. I really appreciate those those views. We're going to move on to our last panelist now, Daniela Gratelli. And uh, Daniela, I know you're representing more health literacy in the education setting. Um, can you give a short summary of why Nemers Children's Health developed this program or developed the program that you did for use in schools and other education settling and what it entails? I, I'm really, really interested in it because I think that's very upstream approach and those are the kind of approaches we really need. Great, well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me here today. So Nemours Children's Health is a multi-state pediatric health system in the Delaware Valley and in Florida. And we encompass a wide range of services. So it's clinical care, research, education, advocacy, and so much more. And we recognize that in order to really advance our mission of creating the healthiest generations of children, we need to partner and we need to do so across sectors. And for youth and adolescents in particular, the educational sector is really important because they spend so much time there. So before I summarize what the collaboration looks like with the education sector, I really wanna invite folks to think back for a second. What first prompted you to take over your own healthcare? How old were you? 
the first time you got sick and you were away from your family, did you have your doctor's name to request an appointment? Did you have a copy of the insurance card for, for yourself or whoever's insurance was covering you? Did you know the answer to all the questions on the registration form? Were you confident in how you would best describe your symptoms? For a lot of folks, that can be that first experience of taking charge of your own healthcare. It can be a crash course and it can be stressful and it can be complicated. And at Nemours Children's, we recognize that there was a need for us to provide some more support for youth and adolescents as they first approach that. And we know really that health literacy, as it increases, people are more likely to get routine preventive care and to have lower rates of preventable hospital and emergency room visits. And we've heard a lot today about the benefits of health literacy. So we thought it was really important to do our part in, in helping to educate. And at the same time, we've seen other major organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Physicians, the American Academy of Family Physicians, They've all released position statements that recognize that adolescents require guidance and education and planning to manage their own health care as they transition into adulthood. So it's kind of within that broader context that we thought it was really important for us to, to do something. So we developed a set of lessons plans known as navigating the healthcare system. So we designed them and we evaluated them to all the points that have been made about the importance of evaluation. Um, and we did so with input from Delaware high school students and their parents. And based on the strong evaluation and outcomes and really positive feedback from teens and parents and teachers, we decided to make the lesson plans available online free of charge back in 2018. And the lesson plans do a couple of things. First, they focus on helping folks know what to inspect, expect as you interact with the healthcare system and healthcare professionals. So it's things like insurance and prescriptions and medical appointments. And then second, it's really building those skills for communicating effectively with care providers, including self-advocacy skills. The materials are suitable for in-class, in-home, after-school, in community settings, and it can be taught virtually. And to date, it's been very well received. In 2022, about 18,000 people visited the homepage for navigating the healthcare system, which was very exciting. And lesson plans have been downloaded in 52 uh, US states and territories as well. Sorry, I had my mute on. Um, excellent. Uh, you know, you were, you were talking about, you know, working with, with teens and youth. I, I have two uh, twin boys, both 18. And so I was wondering if you could provide an example or two from the real world of like the real world of teens that that have received your lesson plans and and how that's gone. Sure. So I'm happy to provide a couple examples. Uh, so first of all, in Alabama, our materials have been used with college students actually who are working towards degrees in health professions. And an instructor from Alabama shared that many of the college students weren't actually aware of the link between health literacy and healthcare utilization, and that many consumers of the healthcare system don't fully understand the nuances of when do you go to a primary care doctor, or when do you go to a specialist, or urgent care, or the emergency room. But after participating in the lessons, the college students had a much more um, in-depth understanding of the role that healthcare providers themselves can play in building health literacy skills within their patients. So that was were important as they were starting to um, approach the workforce themselves. And then a second example that comes to mind is on the high school side. Uh, so Nemours has been working with uh, Waukegan High School in Illinois, and um, the Navigating the Healthcare System lesson plans have been a component of their curriculum for a few years now. And Waukegan is interesting because it's a culturally diverse uh, community with many students who are actually recent immigrants to the United States. So it's important that they understand what is a very complicated healthcare system. And we recently had um, a Navigating the Healthcare System um, podcast and a teacher at Waukegan shared that the whole family actually has been experiencing benefits because the teens are coming home and sharing the lessons that they learned in school with their whole families. And she shared in particular how excited she was to learn uh, that because of the education she had provided around types of insurance and open enrollment, that that was actually the spark for many of the students' families to get coverage. 
So these kinds of stories from the user community are just an affirmation of why health literacy is such an important life skill and why discussions like these are so important. And we all really have a role in helping to promote health literacy among adolescents and their families. Well, well thank you for sharing those stories. One, one last question, you know, given your background, because I believe at Nemo, you're the director of the Office of Child Health Policy and Advocacy. I'd really like to hear from your perspective uh, about just, you know, speaking broadly about using policy as a lever to address health related issues and how it can promote uh, cross sector collaborations. Sure. So as I alluded to um, at the outset at Nemours, we really recognize that the vast majority of health happens outside the walls of the healthcare system in the community. And one of our most important kind of general philosophies is that we have to go well beyond medicine to support the healthiest generations of children. And we think a lot about whole child health, and that's physical, mental, emotional, behavioral, developmental, social, relational, all of those factors and how they come together to impact the health and the well-being of, of a child and of a youth. So we really think about what do we need to do on the individual level and on the broader level. So on the individual level, of course, it's things like connecting families to the host of programs and services that they might need that have um, an impact on all of, all of those um, factors impacting health and well-being. But then when you think on the broader level, it is things like community and population level strategies. And that's where policy and advocacy really fit in. Because at the policy and advocacy level, whether it's at the local, the state, or the federal level, you do have the opportunity to build sustainable change that really can impact the lives of the whole community. And you can help support a thriving community. So when we think about policy development and advocacy, we do so with a wide range of partners across many child serving sectors. So some of it is public health, some of it is education, but it's really kind of coming together and thinking through with the community itself, youth um, and families themselves as well. Um, what does that look like and, and what policies can we advocate for to really have an impact down the road? And those types of collaborations really are at the core of what we need to do to continue to promote health literacy. And again, toward that end, I think the Moors really does appreciate the opportunity to participate in this conversation today on the importance of health literacy because it's these cross-sector conversations and cross-sector um, partnerships that really can move the needle forward to ensure that all patients and families have the strong health literacy skills that they need. Well, thank you everyone. I just wanna thank all the panelists again. You know, I think with the very diverse perspectives that you, you brought, you know, speaking about it from the healthcare system level, the, the provider level, the public health level, and then really, you know, that last really upstream approach of trying to get this in our secondary and elementary and even college courses so that people are learning these skills. Uh, you know, I think it really stresses the importance of, of these life skills that, that we really need. I mean, to, to be honest, I think this should be taught with reading, writing, and and everything else, math. And, and so, you know, I, I, I'm really appreciative of all the, the things that you shared today. I'll turn it back over to Karen. Okay, thank you, Stan. And thank you, panelists. I'll echo, you know, panelists, thank you for sharing your diverse perspectives and all of your valuable insights, but more importantly, what you're all doing collectively to advance health literacy um, actually in our field. And great questions, Stan. Thank you for a great panel. Um, next up, we have uh, two speakers who are going to share their experience of policy in their, in their respective states. So first up, we have Dr. Teresa Wagner, she is Assistant Professor, Department of Lifestyle Health Sciences, School of Health Professionals, and Department of Health Behavior and Health Systems, School of Public Health, University of North Texas Health Science Center. She is the Interim Director and Clinical Executive for Health Literacy, Safer Care Texas, Director of the University of North Texas Health Science Center State Certified Community Health Worker Trainer Programs, and fellow and project director for Texas Center for Health Disparities. So welcome, Dr. Wagner. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And I love Daniela's comments about building um, advocacy in your state. So what do you do when you um, start doing health literacy work in your state and really nothing exists that can help you to um, build this foundation that's needed for health literacy work? So I first came into the uh, work of health literacy in about 2013 when I went back to school for my doctorate. And um, what I soon found out as I began health literacy work and really focused on that in my public health um, doctorate was um, that there was a lot of problems around trying to initiate health literacy work because if it's not mandated, it's nice to do, um, but not necessary to do according to healthcare. Um, and that's because they have a lot of other things that are mandated. Um, they have competing priorities, a lack of, um, there's a lack of, of places to really gain education on health literacy skills. I had to develop my own residency. There's no reimbursement for services in health literacy. It's difficult to retain health literacy staff to drive the culture if there's no pay. And we all needed advocacy efforts to drive change within the state of Texas. So what we did was um, those of us who were in this core group created a nonprofit, joined forces with existing health-related groups, published op-eds and sought research opportunities, educated legislators and provided expert testimony during legislative sessions, led advocacy efforts to drive change and connected the dots to patient safety and achievement of health care's quadruple aim. And I think this is probably one of the most important points. Um, is bringing home the fact that it can improve care, reduce costs, improve the patient experience, and improve overall population health. So here's our board of directors for Health Literacy Texas, the nonprofit that I created. Our mission is to help create, support, and maintain statewide health literacy initiatives to reach optimum population health in Texas. We have an annual conference and monthly webinars based on educating and um, bringing awareness to health literacy as an issue in our state. Um, joining forces with existing health-related groups. So we joined with Texas Public Health Association, Safer Care Texas, which I'm the interim director of, and then Health Literacy Texas all together to devise this one pager to make health understandable by all Texans that can be shared at conferences and through email campaigns. Um, we also work with Texas Public Health Association. They choose different topics to be their uh, policy focus for each legislative year to develop a Texas health literacy resolution that they could bring forth to the legislative session. Writing op-eds, um, this particular one not only supported the fact that health literacy is um, a patient safety issue, but also a health equity issue, and also um, have written op-eds on the link between maternal mortality and health literacy. Educating legislators, making your opinion and the facts known, um, presenting ideas at public meetings, writing letters, um, write ed to educate local, state, and federal legislators, making phone calls, sending emails, or meeting with elected officials to educate them on health literacy, conducting public forums on health literacy issues. You saw this toolkit earlier. I was one of the um, lucky ones to work on this toolkit and also have secured um, the health literacy proclamation in 2019 and 22. We've submitted for 2023, just haven't heard back yet, but another important piece to awareness um, and to help um, bring together a coalition around health literacy in your state. We also work with our Texas State Health Coordinating Council. So if you can't get legislation uh, or educate enough to where legislation gets passed, um, work with those councils that have power to um, drive health literacy in your state. So um, one of the the uh, initiatives in 2023 to 2028 is to support the fur furthering of health literacy and utilization of preventative services for Medicaid recipients, and also to ensure that high school students are educated about the healthcare system and careers in healthcare. 
So lastly, as was mentioned, I'm the interim director of Safer Care Texas, where our mission is to challenge traditional thinking to eliminate preventable harm. So really thinking about that root cause of errors and um, healthcare costs and healthcare quality and people not understanding this infodemic of information. So really saying, well, what is the root cause? And what we know that root cause is is health literacy. So connecting the dots to that quadruple aim. Um, and I actually started as a fellow with um, Safer Care Texas and with our work in health literacy have, have risen to the top as the interim director. Um, do hope that you'll connect with us. And um, thank you so much for having me speak on today's uh, initiative. Thank you so very much, Teresa. What incredible and inspiring work coming out of Texas. Next up, we have a representative from Maryland, Dr. Cynthia Bauer. Dr. Bauer is the endowed chair and director of the University of Maryland Horowitz Center for Health Literacy, which is the nation's first academic health literacy center and she is a professor in the Department of Behavioral and Community Health. Welcome, Dr. Bauer. Great, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. For some reason, my screen isn't sharing and I only have one slide, so um, I'll be talking to you from that one slide. Um, my colleagues have laid a really great foundation for um, the work that's been done nationally and uh, in some specific states. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what's been going on in Maryland. And in Maryland, we're very fortunate to have a Center for Health Literacy that's based in our School of Public Health at our land grant institution here in Maryland. So just a little background, Maryland is an unusual health policy state because we have something called the total cost of care model. Uh, and this is based on the state's negotiation with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And it provides this framework for um, every aspect of health policy in the state. And what we have been doing is working to embed health literacy in that broader context of health policy in Maryland. And so some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about in the few minutes that I have um, relate to a law that was successfully um, passed and went into effect last year in 2022. And it's called the Maryland uh, Consumer Health Information Hub. And what it does is designates the Center for Health Literacy that I direct as the critical infrastructure for the state. So in Maryland, we had a proclamation uh, recognizing health literacy a number of years ago, um, but this law now recognizes health literacy as part of the state's health infrastructure. And a few things that we're going to be doing under this hub approach is to make plain language information widely available. Uh, and this is working with both state and local public agencies that are big purveyors of public information, um, as well as focusing on language access. So uh, cultural competence and a few other things related to that have come up, but language access is a big part of what we're going to be doing under the hub. Uh, part of uh, what we saw during the pandemic is that even though there might have been a flood of uh, information available about the virus, about vaccines, about other mitigation measures, there wasn't a lot of information always available for people whose first language is in English. And also just in terms of just recognizing the literacy challenges, uh, even if you are able to translate information. So we're really trying to bring these two things together, both plain language and language access under the hub. A couple of other things that I wanna draw your attention to here in uh, Maryland are, we have had uh, several laws on the books here in Maryland for a number of years that recommend both health literacy and cultural competence training, uh, both for students in our various health professional schools so that would be not only public health, but also medicine, dentistry, nursing, and pharmacy. And then also for those who are already in practice, uh, there's a law recommending that they have continuing education uh, uh, training in health literacy and cultural competence. And the last thing I wanna mention is that the state has a commission on health equity and uh, it has two subcommittees, one on policy and one on data. 
and we are including uh, health literacy elements in both of those subcommittees. So really trying to raise awareness about a lot of the missing data. So you've heard some about the research and the data that are available from um, you know, the work that's been done over the last two decades. But we have uh, really a lot of uh, data gaps when it comes to both population level uh, health literacy data, but a lot on system performance. So uh, we've heard from our colleagues that it's very important to measure uh, both the status quo, but also the changes we're making. There is very little information that we can uh, look at from a system level that really speaks to uh, where the health literacy gaps are and uh, the impact of the changes we're making. So we're trying to really include uh, health literacy on a number of fronts here in Maryland and make sure that it's embedded uh, not only in the patient safety work that you've heard about, but again, in this broader health policy framework. So thank you for a few minutes to explain what we're uh, doing in Maryland, and I will turn it back to Karen. Well, thank you both, uh, Teresa and Cynthia. Um, I think you give a lot of us hope that it is possible to work with legislators, work at a state level to move um, health literacy initiatives forward into policy um, and just giving us some guidance really on, on where to start. So really excellent presentations. Thank you to your both. Now, next up um, is Michael Valer. Now, Michael is the president and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Advancement. And I have to tell you, the IHA is basically the hub of our health literacy work um, in our nation and um, really offers so many resources for all of us. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Karen. I sure appreciate that. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Um, good morning, if you're in my time zone or the one for uh, one or two forward. Good afternoon, if you're in the East Coast or a little further on. Um, so uh, first of all, this whole panel and everybody, these are all friends and colleagues of mine for many, many years. And this is a great group of people who have really been doing outstanding work in health literacy for many years. I'm just very uh, proud and pleased to be part of this whole group. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Our organization is the Institute for Healthcare Advancement. We're a, a healthcare nonprofit organization. Our mission is to advance health literacy toward health equity. In truth, our goal is to really help support all of the work that you, all the people who, who preceded me um, to allow them and help them to, to, to really uh, do the things that they do uh, and provide some tools and, and, and some opportunities to, to really uh, advance health literacy, as we say, toward health equity. So one of the ways that we do that is through a hub, as Karen mentioned, um, called the Health Literacy Solutions Center. There's the URL there. Um, this is a, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place where everybody in the health literacy community can kind of come together and network and learn and share and ask questions uh, um, one of the things that we uh, uh, provide is a discussion list, uh, currently about 15,000 members uh, around the nationally and internationally are part of this discussion list. Um, the, the Solution Center is free to use. There's no cost. Just sign up and go ahead and start. We don't sell information, anything like that. This is more just to kind of get a sense of who we are and, and how we can best serve everybody here. Again, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, so when you are there on the Solution Center, uh, as I mentioned, there's the main IHA community. It's also known as the Health Literacy Discussion List. Uh, this allows you to connect with the community to ask and answer questions and share resources. We have a member directory, so you can search for members and send a direct message. If you are an expert in health literacy, uh, we encourage you to sign up as an expert in your particular area. That allows us, when we are asked, um, about how to uh, do something, or if we can, you know, provide a subject matter expert, we would have a directory that we can make those referrals from. We also really encourage you to uh, complete your member profile and add your bio. This gives your peers a little better idea of who you are, where you work, and what your your uh, um, your, your special skills are. And we also have a job and internship board uh, where you can find or post a job or an internship. Um, 
again, toward this goal of providing resources for people within the health literacy field is our uh, resource library. Uh, this serves as the main collection of health literacy resources and tools, uh, and it's searchable. We also have our, we, we put out an annual health literacy conference. We've been doing that since 2002, uh, and we don't have all of those kind of archived, but since we went um, virtual um, in the, uh, as a result of the pandemic, those uh, previous uh, IHA conferences are archived and are accessible for members of the uh, health literacy community. Now, I know there's been some questions in the Q&A, and people have referred a little earlier about how we can integrate health literacy into curricula uh, for healthcare professionals, for communication professionals. Um, one of the ways we can do that, and one of the ways that in individuals within the healthcare field can advance their professional development or get on a professional development trajectory is through a program that we develop called the Health Literacy Specialist Certificate Program. It's an assessment-based certificate. It was launched in 21, 2021. It was developed over five years using Institute for Credentialing Excellence 1100 standards. Many of the people on this panel or on this program uh, served as subject matter experts for that. Um, the, um, if you go to the, uh, you can't click the link here, obviously, but if you go to the Solution Center, uh, you can see what that, um, what that looks like. Here are the seven domains of that uh, specialist, uh, health literacy specialist certificate. You can earn individual, what we call micro-credentials in any one of these seven areas, or if you earn all seven of those, you can get the overall health literacy specialist certificate. Um, and there are continuing education credits available as well. This also serves as a framework. Uh, this was a very rigorously designed framework. We use this for our conference. Um, and um, it, it's, it, it is a framework that was designed by the uh, health literacy community. Um, so anyway, if you want to learn more about any of this stuff, please visit healthliteracysolutions.org. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Karen. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you not only for your work, but the work of IHA through all of these years. And I'd like to encourage anyone who has not checked out um, IHA and the Solutions Center. It's free, get on. Um, I'll tell you, I've been interacting with um, the Solutions Center for the last 16 years. and. Uh, Michael's right, it's great in how to network and get the resources that are really critical for us moving our work forward. So now finally, I'd like to introduce um, our esteemed leader of this event, uh, Dr. Janelle Lamont. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine in Biobehavioral Health at the University of Minnesota. And I would just like to say that she has been doing an excellent job pulling everybody together. Um, and she's going to share some closing remarks and calls to action. So it's all yours, Janelle. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Pleasure to be here today. Today, we have learned more about what health literacy is, how it affects the health and safety of all Americans, as well as patient satisfaction and quality of care. We've heard from health professionals that are working in direct patient care, patient education, and public health and their perspectives on why health literacy is important. Simply put, we all live healthier when we understand health information. To meet the goals and objectives of Healthy People 2030, reduce unnecessary healthcare expenditures, and limit the burdens placed on patients and health consumers to navigate our complex health care and health information systems, we need to create systems that fully incorporate health literacy into policy, programs, activities, and operational procedures. Pockets of great health literacy work are happening across government agencies and healthcare organizations. To make a significant impact, advance health literacy, and improve population health across the nation, we need a systems level approach. To do that, we need to add health literacy concepts and skills into the national health education standards to provide health education curricula guidance to state and local government, school administrators, and teachers. We also need to develop a standardized health literacy education curriculum 
for K through 12 public schools. We need to require K through 12 public schools to include health literacy concepts and skills in health education curricula as a core subject. And we need to incorporate required health literacy and clear communication competencies into accreditation processes and standards for graduate and professional schools. We need to appropriate funds for the US Department of Health and Human Services to integrate health literacy into federal, state, local, and tribal health and human service agencies. This should include workforce health literacy training and embedding health literacy into workflows and programmatic activities, policies, and grant funding opportunities. And in terms of research, we need to provide dedicated national institutes of health and other, other federal funding for health literacy specific research. In particular, more support is needed for more health outcome studies, health economic studies, and evidence-based health literacy interventions. Dr. Cynthia Bauer and Dr. Teresa Wagner have showcased policy work in the states of Maryland and Texas. Health literacy advocates, I encourage you all to use these examples and the resources on our website to advance health literacy in your states. To the leadership and attendance from education, healthcare, public health, and social work fields, I hope that you will use the Institute of Medicine's attributes of a health literate organization to build the foundation for health literacy in your organizations. This includes developing a needs assessment and adding health literacy to your strategic plans. And to the Senate and congressional staff in attendance, please take what you've learned today and the resources on the website back to our senators and members of Congress. All Americans have the right to accessible and understandable health information to make informed decisions for the health of their families and communities. In close, I would like to thank the Institute for Healthcare Advancement for, for, for providing the event registration, website, and virtual platform support. I would also like to thank Health Literacy Media for their outstanding graphic design in all of our event materials. And a special thanks to our event planning committee members who put in countless hours to make this event possible. And to the Senate and Congressional staff, leadership and education, healthcare, public health, and social work, health literacy advocates, and everyone else joining us today. Thank you so much for your participation and have a great rest of your day.